What's up, everyone? This is the Rain Race Podcast, episode number 41. Today, we're going to be talking about the Indianapolis 500 entry list and how we're going to get to 33 entries and possibly a couple more. My name is Kyle Cuthbertson, a.k.a. Racing Nation TV, joined by my partner in crime, as usual, Chris Aurelio, a.k.a. GT Rain. Hey, we pulled the switcheroo today. Yeah, I wanted to do that. That was the first time I've ever done an intro to the Rain Race podcast. Pretty proud. Only took 41 episodes. Uh, anyways, I will say, as I always do at the beginning of these episodes, that if you want to join in live discussion, you can leave some comments. Uh, like I said, we're primarily going to be talking about IndyCar and the Indianapolis 500 today. If you have anything to add on that, any questions, you can leave them in the chat, and we will try to answer pretty much all of them. Um... On that note, I do also want to explain that we were off last week. We've been off for a little bit. Um, we had that Wednesday episode a couple of weeks ago, and the um, last Monday we didn't have an episode at all. Just want to apologize for that. Uh, we're going to try to get back onto the standard swing of things Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, hopefully next week we're going to be having an IndyCar preview, so stick around with uh, stick around for that. You can check out some more IndyCar related discussion on this podcast. But yeah, for now we're going to keep it on that IndyCar topic and uh, discuss the Indianapolis 500. So it is officially the month of April, which means only one thing: the month of May is less than a month away. At this point, not really proud of that rhyme at all. Uh, <laughs> We got like 25 days? Yeah, 25 days until the month of May, as it stands right now. And we still have a lot of unanswered questions going into the month. I think today sort of added to those questions rather than detracted from them. Um, but Kyle, I'm going to throw this over to you to lead us on to uh, one of our first stories here today. Uh, which one? There's a couple. <laughs> you can pick one. This is where... Uh, oh. Yeah. Well, are we gonna get into some juicy well, right no, away? No, let's, start gonna... with the, let's start with the hard, the hard, you know, news stories first, and then we'll jump into some of the speculation stuff. Oh, okay. Well, uh, well, today let's talk about the uh, the test that's happening later this week, shall we? Sure. So, uh, in, IndyCar is having a 32 car open test at Indianapolis on Thursday and Friday, uh, which is really interesting uh, because that's pretty much. You know, one more car, and that's the full field. It's basically an Indy 500 practice day. Uh, and it's interesting because there's 32 cars entered, and not all of those cars are actually confirmed entries. Um, you know, the usual announcements we've talked about, plus add in uh, Dryan Reinbold will be there with Sage Karam. They still don't have a deal done. Uh, it's expected that Karam will be back there. But again, there's a possibility he could be racing for Andretti during the month of May. So he's testing for them when they don't have a signed contract. Uh, Cody Ware is going to be in the number 52. Dale Coyne with Rick Ware entry doing his rookie orientation practice. Uh, he doesn't have a solid deal done, but it was also announced today that James Davison said uh, that he wasn't going to be running the Indy 500 uh, because he will be running a 26, uh, 26-race NASCAR Cup Series uh, season schedule. So... It looks like Cody Ware is going to be that guy, but if he happened to not pass the rookie orientation practice or something, uh, or they just don't feel confident in him running the 500 yet, that seat is still open. Uh, and then there's obviously some confirmed entries that are you know, not going to be there, like Charlie Kimball for AJ Foyt Racing, driving the number 11. He won't be there, um, which in one hand it's good because... Like I said, there's two entries right there with Karam and, and Cody Ware that aren't confirmed. But basically, if you add in the last you know confirmed entry that won't be there, we have we have 33 entries pretty much bagged at this point. Um, so pretty much uh, kind of what I've come down to today is... Um, I, well, actually, this isn't... This is just something I figured out. It was the whole how we're going to get to more than 33 cars was kind of like a puzzle in my head. And the final piece kind of like clicked today. So if you take those 32 entries uh, that are basically, that are on that, if you take them and treat them like they're confirmed, uh, if we add the sixth Andretti car, which Andretti said that they're going to run six cars, you add 
uh, another Foyt car on top of the three that they're already running because they have three confirmed. The Kimball won't be in the test. Uh, they're supposedly going to run a fourth car. You have Top Gun Racing, who has yet to confirm what engine ma an engine lease contract. That's the only thing kind of holding them back right now uh, in confirming an entry completely. But they have two chassis ready to go, and RC Anderson as their driver. Uh, so they're more than likely going to be on the list. There's three more entries we just put down right there. Uh, so then that would put us at that would put us at 36 right there. Those three entries. Uh, so that would give us what we had in 2019. We had 36 in 2019. Yeah, we did. Yes, three or three so, yeah. So, yeah, we're looking at a bump day just like 2019, right after a pandemic. Uh, and, you know, basically how the world looks right now. I think that's really impressive uh, that we're pretty much back to the entry list we had in 2019. Uh, some new teams some new entries with you know shank adding a second car uh a new peretta top gun and i think it's it looks really good to have 30 36 entries right now and kind of surprising uh so that's that's pretty much the news the big kind of because i would say right now if we're looking a little into speculation i would say right now that uh the the cody ware seat for dale coin racing i would say it's probably gonna be cody ware um, and then Andretti, so right now the big question to me is Andretti's sixth car. Some people have said Oliver Askew, and I think that deal kind of just comes down to money. Uh, and then we got uh, Sage Karam was kind of rumored, uh, but, I mean, he's got to deal with Ryan Reinbold if that doesn't work out. Uh, and then for an Andretti seat, because when you look at the Foyt fourth entry, I'm kind of swinging towards maybe that car's J.R. Hildebrand because the way Foyt would be able to run another car is if you... Detra so, like, think about you detract the Dry and Reinbold entry, that engine lease opens up, and then they go to... Uh, that engine lease then goes to another team running a Chevy. So they are able to run a fourth car. I think I think literally Salesforce and J.R. Hildebrand could just go over to Foyt. Um and then something else I missed, uh, if you if you haven't heard yet, uh, we haven't covered this on the show in the last couple of weeks, but today actually it was announced that Santino Ferrucci is driving the uh, third Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan car uh, in the 45 High V car, just the same one Piggott ran last year. Uh, so that's been announced. That's a done deal. We we saw that I saw that one coming, but that's a done deal, and he'll be at the test as well. Uh, so that's that's pretty much where everything stands. Andretti cars in question, Foyt's car, Foyt cars in car, question. That's just that's how it is. All right. So there's a lot to unpack there. I think yeah. that was like one of your five minutes straight of talking yeah. about IndyCar. Well, right there now. was a lot there. <laughs> there was quite a bit. A couple of things I think you might have missed uh, that was revealed as of recent. Um, as of today, I actually won Pablo Montoya. Um, was confirmed to be driving the 86 car. It was already confirmed well, that, was, that he was going to be driving for McLaren, yeah. but they, they just confirmed the number. Number I'm pretty 86. sure I confirmed the number a couple weeks ago. But what they also confirmed today, a little bit under the radar. I mean, it, it was definitely out there, but it was, I think, less noticed than uh, than I would have expected, is that he will also be running the Indy GP as well. Mm -hmm. So that sort of confirms. We were asking a couple episodes back why he was testing at Laguna Seca, possibly yeah. just because... He's a McLaren development driver, among other things right now. And we figured that, you know, perhaps it was just a coincidence, but I do remember us bringing up uh, the potential of him running the Indy GP based on that test. So that was just another thing that came out. Um, and then I believe the last thing of solid news we have was Simona Di Silvestro and Peretta landing Rocket Mortgage as a sponsor. Which is uh, hilarious, by the way, because if you if you listen to the last episode, uh -huh. or it might have been the one before that, but when when AJ Foyt announced Rocket as their sponsor, and I said Rocket Mortgage, and Chris Chris uh, corrected me, we now have both Rockets in the IndyCar series. How about that? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do believe that's all we have in terms of driver news. Because there, there was quite a bit to unpack there. So apologies if that was a little bit quick. Um, 
I do see the last note you made um, in terms of actual news is that IndyCar, following their Texas test, um, the PJ1 still wasn't fully removed, and some of the drivers are concerned about that. I don't know if you want to sort of elaborate a little bit more on that. I don't know. I haven't seen, personally, I haven't seen any concerns from drivers in terms of quotes or, or which drivers specifically are concerned, so any elaboration on that? Uh, so basically, we said it a couple of weeks ago on the on the show that Texas was actually trying to remove the PJ1 uh, this year, unlike last year where they just kind of let it sit. Uh, at night, they've been going over the surface, you know, over and over to try and just get that stuff off. And kind of what I, so when we saw pictures of the test and we like pretty much just heard that the PJ1 is still there, um, everyone kind of like freaked out about it. Like we thought this wasn't going to be a problem. Uh, but Texas uh, then started replying to a bunch of people on social media that they are you know, continually working on getting rid of it still, and it's still not completely off. Um, and the other thing that kind of got brought up is that the PJ1, and this is actually kind of scary, that the PJ1 is not going to, like, ever really permanently go away because what happens is when they apply that stuff so much, when the sun beats on it, it's just going to keep making problems on the surface. So Texas might have very well screwed their surface, but what the drivers were saying... Uh, after the test, uh, Graham Rahal has a quote uh, where he said it's a no-go zone. And, um, yeah, <laughs> it's slippery, and uh, hopefully it's not just going to be a... It's not going to be a uh, one-lane track. Pato Awards said that he tried to open up the radius into turn one a couple times, and the car wasn't very happy about it. Um, so, I'd, right now, the Texas race still isn't looking good. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a shame. <laughs> I'll tell you what we were watching. Kyle and I were watching among with some other people for no reason, by the way. The 2011 Indy car race at New Hampshire last night, just in this Discord group, and we were streaming mm -hmm. it. And somehow we managed to watch the entire race without shutting it off. Oh, well, we <laughs> did skip the commercials. Yes, yes. Admittedly, we skipped some of the commercials and, and the yellows, but yeah, the the yellows really saved a lot of time. And uh, my only point with this is, I brought up, didn't New Hampshire get ruined with with uh, PJ one as well? And uh, the answer was yes. So big yes. So my only, you know, it's not even advice. You know, just please stop ruining tracks with PJ one. They got Gateway. They got they got New Hampshire. They got Texas. Ah. Uh. Texas is really Texas really hurts because not only did they ruin the actual layout of the track, I wouldn't say ruin, but they kind of they made it worse. Cause it's not like it's not like the worst thing in the world they could have done, but they made it worse. And then they just they just kind of twisted the knife by adding the PJ one. It's really well, sad. Well, actually, so it was an issue at Texas, not because of was it wasn't it more of an issue of that compound is very dark. And it was like mm -hmm. absorbing a lot of the sunlight and it was getting really hot. And that's what was causing it to be slick rather than the Partially. actual compound itself. I thought that that was what the problem was last year. In which case, couldn't you just rectify that by running it at night, running the race? Well, even at night, it's still slick. Yeah. That is actually one thing. Because now, because last year they didn't make attempts to get rid of it. And I don't think they reapplied it. And I think, actually, I think that was like the problem was with it. I think... I think Colton Herta told us that if it like the PJ one, if it's like fresh applied for them, like it's not a huge thing. Um, but the like since they don't reapply it because it's not, you know, it's just kind of there from when NASCAR was there. It's just like when it's just kind of like old PJ one that's just been sitting there untouched. It's it's not the same, and it just kind of sucks. Um, I'm interested now that they actually did try to remove it and it's kind of just like a stain and I think it comes up like I said uh, when the sun beats on it it's gonna be interesting if it like gets better uh, when the when the like track temp goes down um, but yeah for a year when Texas has a double header this is very uh, it's very is is sad <laughs> all right let's jump back to the 
32 car test at IMS this week. Uh, I almost called it an open test in terms of open as spectators, but that jumps right onto our next topic, which is that it'll be closed for spectators. First time, uh, you, you know, I don't, I don't know the last time they ran sort of that that pre-May test without spectators where they like actually close it off because usually what you people will just do is they'll go into the track and you know the same way you'd be going to the museum and you'd stand over on the spectator mounds from what i know i've never done this um but from what we've heard from nathan brown uh it looks like they're actively going to be preventing people from doing that this week Mm -hmm. so while the museum is going to be open still they're going to (laughs) They're going to uh, prevent people from actually trying to pay attention to what's going on at the test. Certainly standing around there and filming for hours on end, which I know, Kyle, is something you had planned on doing. I still plan on going to Indy, you know. I still plan on going and hanging out. Because it's going to get, Thursday is going to get rained out anyways. Mm-hmm. And I'd rather get rained on in Indiana than in Ohio. So why not? I'm go chill with David, go hang out. Sure. You know, take a day off work. <laughs> Much needed vacation. Getting burnt out. Go hang out at Indy. Why not? (laughs) So for those people who are interested in watching this test, you can watch it on Peacock Premium, uh, which is the NBC streaming service that IndyCar has penned a deal with for this year that replaced NBC Sports Gold. We talked about this, I think, in our first episode since we rebooted the podcast that I think Peacock is an overall better move than NBC Sports Gold was simply because it's on a month-by-month basis. Let me say one thing before anyone gets mad about having to right now they're doing like a seven day free trial well so if you want to watch the test you can like watch it on a free trial you don't have to pay to now to get the rest of the season like obviously the other stuff you got to pay for it, but if you want to watch this test i mean you can watch it for free well that's just like a peacock thing like they're they're a streaming service so they offer seven day free trial whenever but yeah you know well you know but the indie cars indie cars trying to like use this test to get people on the peacock so they're using that seven-day free trial to their advantage. I'll tell you what, though. I saw on, I think, the IndyCar Reddit. Yeah, it must have been the IndyCar Reddit that there is um, some deal with Peacock and the WWE Network because the WWE Network is now on Peacock or something like that. I don't know. I don't pay too much attention yeah. to that. Um, where you can get four months of Peacock Premium, which is usually $5 a month for, I think, I think it's four months for 10 bucks. Or mm. for four months for five bucks or something like that. It's a pretty good deal. You can go check it out. I don't know how long that's going to be going on, but if you see yourself using this over the month of May, I mean, it's pretty much going to pay itself just in the content you're going to get next month. So I would recommend uh, checking that out if you are interested. Again, I think it was on the IndyCar Reddit, and uh, you should be able to find a link to that. It was on the... Um, no, it was definitely the IndyCar Reddit because it was the post that was talking about... Um, it was the uh, the post from NBC's press release, NBC Sports's press release from today. So you can probably find it in the comments of that. Um, now I definitely want to like keep talking about the test being closed to the public sure. and what that like might mean. But one thing I do want to say, since we're on the topic of Peacock, because I thought of this literally like 20, 30 minutes ago, um, and I tweeted this. I would, I, I would much, I would not be like, I'd be more confident. In IndyCar and NBC, like streaming a few races only, the streaming only races, if they didn't use practice and qualifying as a money grab rather than a, like a promotion, because like I I subscribe to Flow Racing, which covers dirt racing, and it's like a, it's like a, I don't even remember how much it is a year. It's like one hundred and fifty dollars a year or something like that. But if you don't have Flow Racing, then they stream the practices. Uh, and I think qualifying and sometimes even heats on their YouTube for free, kind of like as a promotional tool. Like, hey, if you want to watch the feature to this practice or qualifying, uh, subscribe to, you know, Flow Racing. So I mean, they so they use it as a promotional tool, and I think, I think it honestly would be smarter for IndyCar and NBC to kind of put qualifying and practice out there, and the whole time, like, if you want to watch the race, make sure you subscribe to peacock tv you know and use it more of like promotion um because just having all of it under a paywall i think is like is just too much i think you need to have something out there that people can just easily and readily 
watch and like if they're if they become invested then maybe they'll want to you know pay and watch the race you know so i mean i that's just that's just my thoughts generally because i just randomly thought of that i'm like it using practice and qualifying as a money grab especially trying to make that money grab aim towards like the hardcore fans who would want to watch who would like absolutely uh, do anything to watch practice and qualifying because they just don't want to miss it at all, period. I think I, I would just, I'd be a little bit more confident and okay with a few races having to be streamed if you didn't try and use these uh, other things that should be free as a money grab. While you were going on about that, I saw a comment from Taras who pointed out, because uh, I forgot about this actually, that if you have Xfinity... I don't know the extent of that. I don't know if it's just like Xfinity Internet or if you need to have their TV plan too. You'd have to look into that. Uh, but you can get Peacock Premium for free. So if you already have them as a provider, check into that because you might be able to get IndyCar, all, all the extra IndyCar content and other motorsports as well because Supercross is on there as well, mm -hmm. uh, free of charge. You can charge. watch The Office on there. Yes, you can. <laughs> I enjoy that. See, I'm, I'm fine with Peacock, honestly. It's way better than NBC Gold. I, oh, yeah. I would complain about NBC Gold for hours, but, like, the fact it's The only thing that's annoying about it is it's just, like, it's another streaming service, which you can just say that, you know, about anything. Like Paramount, Paramount Plus, I have to pay for... <laughs> if I want to watch this, I got to pay for Paramount Plus. If I want to watch this, I got to get Amazon Prime. If I got to want this, I got to get Hulu. I got to get Disney Plus. There's just so many now because everyone has one. That's the only real complaint with the streaming services and why they're getting annoying. But it's it's the future, I guess. So you got to roll with it. Going back to the IndyCar test, uh, that is going to be taking place later in the week. I know you said it is. everybody's expecting that it's going to be raining on Thursday. So yeah. it might be full Friday, up, or full Friday uh, day of action. There are some no. contingency plans to stay on Saturday, too, if they just get whomped. Mm -hmm. I think the first contingency is, like, have an ex extend the session on Friday, and then, like, if Friday has some delay, then go Saturday, too. Right. Um, now, there is a, a, a critic who is an accomplice of ours, who, more specifically Kyle, who has been going on Twitter, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and saying that this is symbol of future things to come um i just want to get into this a little bit because i personally don't believe that this test having no fans is a threat um to the plans that they have for the month of may itself if anything it could potentially and again this is just my take on the situation i'm not too sure uh, but my take on the situation is that you want to try to avoid negative publicity right now. And hypothetically, you know, in an unlikely world, let's say hundreds of people show up to this test and they're all standing on the turn two mounds and they generate some negative publicity from that. It certainly wouldn't look too great for IMS, who right now I'm sure is in a position where they're in tough negotiations with the state as they were last year. Now, last year, before... I guess the month of August. I don't remember what date, Kyle, you were there, so you can tell me. But the Battle of August, the Brickyard. Oh, it was like first, like last week in July to like okay. the first of August. Um, so the Battle of the Brickyard, I sort of said similar things about that, where that was IMS's, you know, it, granted that had nothing to do with IndyCar or the Indy 500, but it still was an event going on at IMS. And, and they didn't want to generate any negative publicity from that event. And I know you had told me that people within the track were, were pretty adamant on making sure that no negative publicity from that event was getting out. Personally, I see this as the same thing um, rather than uh, a sign of future things to come. But I do want to get your take on that. Yeah, there were a few hundred people at Battle of the Brickyard and they uh, basically like a few karting races. They didn't want a lot of because like there was i mean obviously like it was it was safe there was a lot of uh like you had to wear masks and and everywhere basically except for your own pit area you had to remain social distance but even then they were so like they were so kind of they were worried about the next few weeks obviously being the biggest like the big the indy 500 uh that they didn't want a lot of you know press 
uh, getting out on it and a lot of they didn't they didn't want it to become a big deal for no reason because because they knew and we knew that were there that it was you know we were doing it safely everything was going well everything was but like from an outside perspective there's so many ways it can be twisted and turned you know so they didn't want a lot of press getting out about that um and so from this is like i wouldn't say that it's directly like a sign of what's to come in the fe- like to the future but it's definitely concerning when you know cuz it and it lines up with some of the things i've been told uh behind the scenes of you know trying to get fans at the 500 and what type of hoops the states making them jump through which is why it's concerning cuz it's just like when you hear those things you don't want them to be real and then when they do something like this that totally lines up with what you're hearing it's like okay that sucks um but i mean they were cuz it's just when you're after last year you're so antsy you're so like in your head about how it how it went down and so th- when you think about it w- if they can't safe if like they don't aren't trusted i guess would be the word to have maybe 200 people on the mounds or in the parking lot then like what how are we expecting them to be allowed to host say even 25 50,000 people in the stands uh that cuz i mean and it was also kind of a, like a it was kind of just random too because what i had heard early in the week was that fans were going to be allowed for one and two that they were even thinking about opening up some stands uh for the test cuz it was a 32 car test like it's a big deal they knew there was going to be a lot of people there um and even i mean even you know to say no fans why didn't you just open up a couple stands i mean i that that also but i mean i i do understand why because it's it is a risk and it's probably not a risk that's worth it before the month of may um but i mean it's just when you're already at a level of concern uh after last year you just like to see this isn't isn't very uh it's not the best news to hear so we're talking about a race now that's taking place less than seven weeks away at this point yeah um i have voiced concerns privately but i don't think publicly really about the fact that a couple of weeks ago roger penske said he plans on you know this was i think an ambitious plan even by his standards um 250,000 people at the Indy 500 this year. Mm-hmm. I said since the beginning, right when he said that, you're not going to get 250,000 people in the stands for this year's Indy 500 if it takes place in May. You you could move it to October, and you'd still probably be a little hard-pressed to get 250,000 people in the stands. Um, so I've said this could lead to problems, because I can go on IMS.com right now and order tickets, and... I could be wrong, but I think I saw a number recently saying they sold somewhere in the realm of 170,000 tickets already. Something like that. Um, I, I hope I'm remembering that correctly. Um, which, the last thing that they really want, I think, is a situation like last year where we're three weeks out. Um, I mean, it was... We were, I think, well into the first week of August last year before they said... Uh, no fans were going to be allowed. And granted, that was sort of a a blindsided announcement. Mm -hmm. But do I think that they're going to be in a similar situation this year where they have no fans at the race? Honestly, no. I think that they're going to have some form of reduced capacity this year. But I do think that it's pretty ambitious to still be selling tickets at this rate when you've sold 170,000 in you're trying to sell more at the moment without showing any indications that you are trying to, you know, ask people if they want to move their tickets to next year again, or if they still want those tickets. Um, because I think flat out, I don't see them getting even 170,000 people. Mm -hmm. That's that number right there is pretty much half of IMS's capacity on race day. Once you include the infield, 
I don't see that number happening. I certainly don't see 250,000 happening. Um, the only thing that settles the concern a little bit in that is that you can always, since you haven't shipped, you I mean, they haven't shipped out any tickets. You can always go right. on like whatever capacity you're forced to. Uh, you can just do a first come first serve basis, you know, and because uh, basically, because I don't believe they're really, because I haven't, I think you can buy a ticket, but at most of the, and like Taurus just said, I think that 170K is based on renewed tickets, just based off people from last year that carried them over. Um, I So I think that's just all renewed. So I think there will be a point where in that they can just basically ask people, because like, they did that last year around the same, it was like mid-July. Uh, so I would guess it would come soon, very soon, when they start asking, they get a number and they start asking people um, whether they'd want their tickets moved or whether what they'd want to do with them. But um, the one thing I know is I th they're still waiting on more data from the NCAA tournaments that just happened. Because that was another big thing in fan attendance uh, that was being talked about. Because uh, obviously when you have that many people for the tournament, that kind of is like a testing ground for whether or not you can host fans at the Indy 500. Um, so there was late... So another thing that was brought up on social media when they announced that no fans would be allowed at the test... Um, is that recently in Indy, uh, an Alabama fan who came for the March Madness uh, went to St. Elmo's, which is a like restaurant in Indianapolis, highly regarded rest like the restaurant in downtown Indianapolis, uh, and like nine of the staff at St. Elmo's uh, tested positive for COVID. So I think, I think on top of that, they're a little like wary of that because that happened. Um, so. I, so they they still have things that need to be worked on, and the state still obviously needs things that you know they want kind of marked on their list uh, before they approve fans and get things done. Now, the other, so what's going on on around the nation is weird, which I'm not going to get too much into it. But if you just look at a national scope here, you have states that are just flat out getting rid of mass mandates and just saying screw it at this point, which I'm not going to get political. It doesn't matter which side. There's just states that are, you, yeah, you know. like And then Texas, like the MLB game, the Rangers, I'm sure everyone's seen on social media, they had a, a sold-out crowd, absolutely packed the stadium this early. And Indiana, Indiana is such a weird, like, I was th also thinking about that today. Like, it's such a weird, because they're supposedly tomorrow getting rid of their mass mandate. <laughs> Did you like they're getting rid of yeah. the mass mandate? Mm -hmm. Which I mean, obviously the mass mandate's going away is that doesn't affect private property. So like, realistically, nothing's going to change. But um, but then at the same time, oh, and they're also they also had the March Madness, which how many people were at those games? Like ten thousand. And they're doing other things. But then every time it comes to the Speedway, it's just like a big a big no and a bunch of just... And with everything else going on around the country, it's just, you look at that and you look at Indy and it's like we haven't made any progress. We haven't... Like, what are what's happening? Mm -hmm. And Indiana is even a state. And it's weird because Ohio, I did hear that, that we're now 16 plus... Uh, age group on vaccines, but I thought we were still like 50s. Uh, but I know I've known for like weeks now that Indiana has been ahead, and they they've actually been at the 16 and older uh, for vaccinations for a while. And I think they're I think we're at like 13 per, or 15 percent vaccinated at this point. And so, and then just based, I mean, so Chris, I I think I think literally anyone could agree with this and this is what i've been saying this whole time is no matter like with a seating capacity of two hundred and fifty thousand ims to have zero spectators do you think that's like do you think that's logical no <laughs> not, not this year certainly last year they got the the, the uh 
I don't know the, what analogy I'm going for here. The cookie crumbled basically mm-hmm. on them at the last minute and they were kind of stuck. Uh, I th- would assume they're doing everything in their power to avoid the same situation from happening this year. We are in a significantly better position right now than we were last August in terms of vaccinations and overall confidence of the public. It's still not, you know, 250,000 people at the track confident no. um, on a mass scale. Um, and, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I don't know anything, uh, you know, too specific and I'm not a doctor, so I can't give an exact number, but I, you know, the number that gets thrown around a lot, even last August was quarter capacity. Um, I think you could probably pull that off. I'm not too sure, though. My I main concern hard. still does lie with with how much they... You know, I think their expectations right now are still a little bit too high. And at what point are, are they going to backtrack on it? Because the way I see it right now, they're going to have to backtrack on that 250000 I think they're backtracking when they have to. <laughs> yeah, but... Okay, so but when you backtrack, then what's your plan? You know, are some people just going to be stuck without without tickets again, just like last year? And then some people do get in. At least last year, when they said no fans, that was easy because you have no fans, and it wasn't really anybody in particular who was getting screwed over. I think this year, depending on how everything plays out, it could be a different scenario where you have some certain unangry or unhappy fans based on whether or not they're actually able to attend. But I said this a few minutes ago, and I'll say it again. This is We're talking about a race that's seven weeks away, mm-hmm. and some people start going to Indy on qualifying weekend, even as early yeah. as practice weekend. You're talking five, six weeks away here. Um, you know, especially the GP. The GP would only be five weeks away, I want to say. Um, yeah. Or, no, Five weeks from this coming weekend, I believe. Yeah. And so people need to make travel plans for that sort of stuff. You know, I'll I'll be honest in saying that I was planning on going... Well, I was, I was really planning on going to the Indy 500 last year with you, of course. And then that didn't happen. And just sort of as like a fun, yeah, you know, let's let's do this next year sort of thing without really thinking about it. I renewed the tickets. So I still have those tickets renewed. So I'm part of that 170,000 number somewhere. It's um, funny that I'm actually not. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not planning on going to the race this year just, you know, for my own personal reasons of not wanting to go to a, an Indy 500 if it isn't the full experience. I'd rather just wait it off another year and hopefully get to have the the full proper experience, that sort of deal. But if I was still planning on going, you know, I'd have to be looking right now at refundable hotel, refundable flights, because we're seven weeks away from the race, and I still don't know if I'd be able to go. And I know the track and the, the town and everybody right now is in a difficult situation, but I think I even called this out, called them out on this last year, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Indianapolis and the Indy 500 were pretty much the last people to formally delay the race. And then I was a little bit more antsy because I was like, all right, I have reservations and and tickets to this race and I don't even know if it's going to be happening. So I think this is sort of a similar situation. In my opinion, they're going to have to come out with something, you know, regardless of how difficult the scenarios are right now, you're going to have to come out with something a week, two weeks from now at the latest. I think one month away from the GP is where you need to be shooting for how many people can we actually get here? How many tickets are they going to let us sell? And if we get to race day and it could have been more or it should have been less, then that's just something we're going to have to take the downfall on. But you can't wait until two or three weeks out to, to get a formal number. And I'm sure they're not planning on that, but but uh, I was certainly expecting and hoping that by now they would have had that number in hand. Well, the other thing, too, that's hard to predict, and it's what I'm sure the the state is probably one of the things the state's, like, working with them to do uh, is because, obviously, with how many vaccines are, are being rolled out right now, it's harder it's hard to predict, you know, by the time the race happens, how many people will be vaccinated. Um, 
and which is another reason why IMS has been working to uh, actually do the vaccinations on property uh, in the last few weeks. They've had a couple couple thousand vaccines in IMS. Uh, so it's just kind of hard to predict what it's going to be like come May. Because I think, as everyone knows at this point, if, you know, that some point this year, there's going to be a point where this drastically gets better, I would say, hopefully. Knock on wood, because this we're, we're in a very unpredictable times. Everything could hit the fan, like hit the fan. When I say hit the fan, I mean like really hit the fan. Something could hit the fan again, but like I think everyone kind of feels like this this year at some point, which has been predicted the NMA, by the way, uh, that things will get drastically better uh, in this pandemic. So we're still, like you said, seven weeks. Seven weeks could, could make a huge difference, uh, and especially how the state feels about it. Um, and then, sadly, the state uh, doesn't always... You know, they don't always, they're not thinking as much about uh, like deadline for tickets and travel plans as maybe IMS is or, uh, or uh, so, I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is. Let me ask you, because I think this is a sort of a curveball question. Would you be willing to have them delay the race for the second year in a row? for the same reason that they did last year where they're trying to get as many people in attendance as possible? Or at this point, would you rather just say, do it in May with however many people you plan on having because <laughs> it could end up biting them in the ass like it did last year? I mean, it'd be, it'd be tough. You know, if they, I would say the only way I would move it is if the state, is just absolutely so adamant and you are forced to do no fans because I mean, honestly, I would be, I would be, I would be kind of all right if they ran it in May and had like 25,000, like if they just had like a cup, like, cause my minimum number I've been throwing out every time is 25,000 because to me, 25,000 inside 250,000 seats is just like, the most no brainer decision you could make. Like, that's just like, that's sure. ridiculous. You yeah. could, you could social distance like way over six feet. It's ridiculous how like <laughs> you, you could at, at 25,000 at 250,000 seats, instead of having people like sit in their like group of like five, you could spread them out as well. That's how many, how much space you would have. It's ridiculous. Um, but I mean, if they're like forced to have zero fans, then move it. Okay, because the absolute bottom line to me this year is we cannot have another Indy 500 without fans entirely. Like, it, it's just, I don't think it should, and I don't, I don't think it can happen. It's just, it would be ridiculous. So if there's like, if they are getting atrociously just bullied so hard by the state that they are forced to basically not have fans, or even if IU Health decides to pull some crap again uh i would i would for sure move it if you were forced to have zero fans now that month of may would be very hard that would suck i after last last may i never wanted to do that again and then after the race in august sitting outside the fence i immediately turned to joe and i said let's get out of here i never want to do this crap again like sit outside the track like i net that this was fun for the four hours we sat here like it was fun like during the race but then after the race i was like that's this is that's the only time in my life I ever want to do that, uh, and I I don't want to sit through another May without an Indy 500. But if they were bullied by the state to the point where they'd have to have zero fans, then yeah, I'd move it. Which another thing they've done this year is the the Battle of the Brickyard Karting Race we were talking about earlier that happened at the end of July last year. They had a date for July 4th weekend, and that got that got uh canceled so ims basically told them no uh there's another thing happening that weekend and from what i've heard they haven't gotten another date so basically i mean i think ims already has there was something else that i can't remember 
that came out a few weeks ago that I think I honestly think IMS has some like back of the mind contingency plans. Do I think they'll have to use them to move out of Maine? No, but but I mean I do think IMS has that slightly on the brain that it could possibly happen. They know there's a possibility. Um, so yeah, a long answer to your question, but like if it, sure. if it came down to having to have zero. Then yeah, move it. But if you if you had to run it with a minimum of like twenty five thousand fans, then uh, then just go ahead and run it. And hopefully, I'm a part of that twenty five thousand. But if I'm not, then I'll be happy for the people that get to go in because at least some people get to go in. And I would hope that the people that got to go in were the people who have had tickets for gener- like decades. That's what I would hope because I know the Daytona five hundred this year was. I know there were people who had gone to the race like their entire lives uh, who didn't get to go and they wanted to. And then there were people who last minute decided to go that got to go, which was stupid. I don't, I don't <laughs> agree with that. Like our buddy Matt Skipper didn't get to go. But uh, I, I had a, have a buddy who knows a guy who decided like a week before the race he wanted to go and somehow he was able to get a ticket. Like, it just didn't make sense. It was just stupid. But... uh it wasn't like a week before, but like right before like ticket like announced the thing. And it's just like, man, uh. So yeah. All right, let's uh, let's move it off the speculation because that's all it is at the end of the day, as always. Um, and I do want to ask you real quick, what else can we be expecting from this test at IMS? Um, I'm still an amateur when it comes to the ins and outs of what's going on within IndyCar, despite how much I try to pay attention to it. They, correct me if I'm wrong, but are they testing a new floor? Yes. Okay. There are aero changes this year to try and improve the racing at IMS, because that's been a thing where they've had too little uh, downforce, or, or not too little downforce, but too little like adjustment that you can make to the downforce. Uh, to where, like, in 2018, when it was extremely hot, like, record temp hot during the race, that pretty much every team had the same aero configuration of just uh, put all the downforce in it, and it still made the racing horrid because all the downforce in it is, like, just such a minor change from none of the downforce in it. Because mm-hmm. there's just... You've seen that. Everyone's listening to this, hopefully, has seen the oval kit kit car where like they have the tiny front wing and the tiny rear wing and it's just I mean on the floor there's nothing to there's nothing to change with the floor it's just it's just a uh, it's just a diffuser and then there's a couple the only real changes besides angle on the wings you can make is the 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 gurney flaps or like the wickers that you see you know just like that doesn't increase or decrease in as large of increments as you'd probably want uh on the weather conditions now it being so early in the year i would say the cooler temperatures probably won't give you too much uh but so really what i think we'll be seeing is guys just sort of trying to you know get a baseline for the new aero configurations and then you'll also the obvious the amount of people who have to go through the rookie orientation practice and also the the uh, refresher course because there's also there's rookie orientation which they're not the rookies aren't going to be able to like actually they might be able to actually pass their rookie tests on in like on Thursday or Friday but obviously you have the rookie stuff but then they also have the refresher where if you're I think it's 2 years because uh yeah cuz Alonzo had to do a refresher it's like if you haven't been in an Indy car for a certain time so like uh Pablo Montoya even though he's a two-time Indy 500 champion is going to have to take the refresher course, as funny as that is. Uh, Simona is going to have to take a refresher. And then usually the one-offs have to. Um, just pretty much all of them. Uh, Pietro, actually Pietro has to take a rookie test. Uh, Cody Ware has to do the rookie test. Uh, and guys, uh, I think I think that's I think that's probably it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, cause yeah, I was wondering about that new floor as well. Um, it's sort of been a talking point with the new cars that they introduced in 2018 that they haven't been able to race as close or quite as hard as they were able to certainly back in 2013, 2014. 
and then also even the arrow kit era uh with the exception i guess of the 2019 8500 where you had rossi and pagino at the finish but still that wasn't the same level that we were seeing maybe six years ago and that's up for debate on whether or not you actually like that style of racing i know that that's sort of a hot topic in its own what i'd actually wonder is if as a slight offset of this if uh if we can get some even slightly quicker speeds in the month of may uh, when you look around qualifying and fast friday because i'm not an engineer let's start this by saying that but more underbody downforce uh, hypothetically means you should be able to minimize the more draggy <laughs> for lack of a better term uh, just overbody downforce i guess uh from the front wing and the rear wing which less drag more speed who knows that's uh that's my slight take on that it's one of the big things that they're going to be test like the one thing for the changes are made for is obviously last year we had the introduction of the aero screen uh mm -hmm. which made the cars very top heavy and obviously in a race car or really any car you're trying to gain perform performance out of when you add weight to a car normally you want to make the weight as low as you can uh, because right. of the center of gravity and so what they wanted to do after last year what they wanted to do is create more grip out of the front end without like overstressing what to do on the front wing itself. Uh, so basically the the route they went is by changing the floor and not totally like the underneath the car, but if you look at an indie car, they have where what we used to call the sponsor blockers where they used to have those contact things, fins on the side. Uh, that they got rid of, but now they still have like the floor that extends like under past the side pod, which I thought was a weird design, but they did it. Uh, and they have those holes. Basically, they kind of changed kind of the, the mold and how that reacts. And then inside that hole, they added another like winglet. They had like a wing inside of that to try and create downforce from the bottom on the sides. And they also added kind of like a Formula One style. Uh, like fin in front, right in front of the, the air box on the sides. Uh, Formula One style, you, you kind of know what I mean, to where it's it's close to the cockpit and it's just a it's just a rectangled fin, kind of at the bottom. Uh, just go on Google and look up IndyCar uh, floor changes, 2020, 2021, because they actually did the first test of this, is September of uh, 2020. And then they did like a four car test last two weeks ago because they were testing the uh, the push to pass to kind of simulate the hybrid system they're they're uh, bringing in 2023 or four. I don't even remember because I don't <laughs> care that much about the hybrid. Not gonna lie, uh, but uh, so which by the way, an update on that push to pass test. The drivers didn't like it. <laughs> The, the, the kind of consensus I got out of that push to pass test hearing about it was like the teams thought it was pointless and the drivers didn't enjoy it so there's that but yeah these new floor changes they're basically just hoping to try and add more front grip to the front end uh, without overcompensating the front wing because it's already so small and they already added bigger wickers to it so yeah yeah, Taras had pointed out that they were testing those updates, those car updates at the Curse test that was a week and a half ago as well, like you just mentioned. Which, by the way, thank you, Taras, for being uh, so helpful in the chat. I'm not calling out names here, but, but Kyle, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the chat, but one of our friends is having a having a field day. But uh, oh, yeah. but uh, anyways, what was I saying? On topic here. Um, yeah, so 32 car test. I am more interested to see how those updates actually fare in testing conditions. Now, it's not really going to be representative of race conditions. Every year at Indy 500 practice, you see like a huge line of cars. And you think like, oh, wow, if the race can be like this and people are passing like this, this is going to be incredible. And the race usually tends to be not quite what we're seeing in practice obviously you know you're comparing two different things and testing is falling in the same category as practice here so it's not going to be extremely representative but uh, nonetheless i am interested to see if drivers are able to pull off some passes 
um, that maybe were a little bit sketchy to try beforehand in the past couple of years. We'll have to wait and see, but we will be recapping that test next week uh, alongside our IndyCar preview. So do ch do stick around and tune in next Monday at the same time if you want to check that out. Uh, I think the final thing I want to talk about on this episode, jumping back to speculation a little bit, um, and I do want to credit Marshall Pruitt for this. Uh, I just sort of want to tag on to some of the things that he was speculating in a latest, in a, in a recent racer article, um, updating LMDH for IMSA. He had mentioned that Audi and Porsche are planning on selecting Multimatic as their chassis supplier. Now, I'd heard that actually from a couple of different sources over the past couple of weeks. It was a little bit of a surprise because I think a lot of people were expecting Audi to go with Talara based on their history. I think I pointed that out in the last episode as well. Might be wrong. Um, so yeah, it looks like right now there's a chance they go with uh, Multimatic. But then also mainly what I want to talk about here and what I found interesting is that it looks like the Volkswagen group as a whole is very interested in getting quite a few of their manufacturers involved in LMDH sort of as a cheaper way to get brand exposure. Uh, you know, Obviously, LMDH is a budget-focused category of racing, and DPI and IMSA has already been very successful, I think, for manufacturers. It's you know, done its job in being cost efficient while also being relevant and interesting at the same time. And LMDH, I think, is even more appealing to some of these manufacturers because of that hybrid aspect. So Marshall pointed out two additions that we could see from the Volkswagen group, which could be Bentley and Lamborghini. Now, I just want to talk about this briefly because Bentley, I've been speculating for the past couple of years that they would try to make a return. And he actually pointed out in this article that while Audi and Porsche would likely be making a 2023 debut, uh, Bentley and Lamborghini, if they do show up, would be appearing a season later in 2024. Uh, now, if you know about Le Mans history, the 24 Hours of Le Mans, you would know that Bentley won that race in 1924, the second running of the race. And I've always speculated for the past few years, like I said, that Bentley would try to win the 100th anniversary of that. Uh, ever since Yoast announced that they were departing from the Mazda uh, DPI program and Ralph Yutner said they were going over to Germany to work on an undisclosed project. Still don't know if we found out what that was unless that ended up being the Glickenhaus deal, but I can't imagine they would have been preparing for that Glickenhaus deal. Uh, I guess that would have been back in 2018 when he said that, 2019. Um, I had sort of gone under the assumption that Bentley would be planning a prototype return to Le Mans, uh, potentially in 2023, but it looks like 2024 would be more likely if it happens. But I did find that pretty interesting. And then Lamborghini as well, which they've been sort of in and out of the rumor mill. I even saw them rumored for like GTE back when that was not a dying formula. Uh, but I would be very interested to see even one of those manufacturers show up to the LMDH ranks, let alone two. Uh, if we have four Volkswagen Group manufacturers all competing in one formula, I think that that would be pretty unprecedented. I know that the most we've probably seen in the past would probably be Audi and Bentley competing up against each other in 2003 at Le Mans, and actually 2001 and two for that matter as well and Audi and Porsche competing against each other in the American Le Mans series in 2005, the R Spider started, I think, to 2008. Um, yeah, that's just, that's just what I picked out of that. Other manufacturers that were on the list, uh, BMW with Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan, Bobby Ray Hall, and I mentioned this a couple podcasts back, Bobby Ray Hall did say that he wants to try to jump up to the LMDH ranks with BMW if BMW is interested in that. So it looks like that may be a possibility. Marshall did seem pretty 
I don't want to say pretty confident about that, but certainly more confident than some of the other manufacturers, including Ford, McLaren, and Hyundai. Uh, well, I don't see three. BMW just becoming like GTD only in the future. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Well, yeah, because BMW is pulling their name out of Formula E. Granted, they're still going to be supplying Andretti with the with the power unit. Um, Ford, as I mentioned, has already been in and out of the rumor mill. I think they've been more one of the more likely candidates to jump up to LMDH. I say jump up. They're actually not in IMSA at all right now, at least in the WeatherTech Championship. Ever, ever since the uh, GT program ended, I think a lot of people have been hyping that up and McLaren they've really been in and out mostly out I mean McLaren has hyped up a lot of things in the past uh, that d didn't really end up going anywhere but Marshall did say let's see he said in quotes the topic is getting warmer each day with regards to McLaren actually committing to LMDH that'd be sick yeah it really would be and that just sort of brings me to my final point here of, you know, the, the article itself is titled LMDH is poised to carry IMSA into a new golden era. I'd recommend checking out that article because it is pretty well written. Um, you know, if we even get a handful of these manufacturers, because right now the only three that are fully committed at the moment are uh, Acura, Porsche, and Audi, all for 2023. If we get even two more of those manufacturers, you know, he's absolutely right that this is going to be another golden era of prototype racing, adding in the Le Mans hypercars over on the World Endurance Championship side with Ferrari and Toyota and Peugeot and Glickenhaus and Baikalas and yeah, <laughs> certainly a lot to unpack there. And I am very excited, but I am also equally skeptical, and I have mentioned that in the past where if you have these two different formulas that are destined to race up against each other at the 24 hours of Le Mans, you'd better not screw it up because there's nothing I want to see more than Audi versus Peugeot again and Audi versus Porsche again, all competing for the top step of Le Mans. Hell, even throw Bentley in the mix. You know, I'd love to see Bentley try to win Le Mans on their 100th anniversary of winning that second running. There's still... A lot to come in the news. I think someone just series, needs so. to go to Ford's boardroom and tell them that they make <laughs> ugly cars and ugly little factories. Yeah, you know, I'd in an ideal world, I would love to see more manufacturers step up to Le Mans hypercar. I just think it's a little bit more interesting when you can develop your own chassis. And I think that Ferrari going to that to that side is certainly exciting. So we'll see. We got a couple more years to wait there, but I would expect 2021 is going to be, you know, if it's not 2021, it's going to be 2022 when we start to see some really, really positive announcements on that front. And uh, nothing but positivity on my front looking into the future. So I'm excited about that. Anyways, I was going to wrap it up for this episode of the Rain Race Podcast. I think you can check us out again. I'm going to say this for the fifth time probably you can check us out next week hopefully the same time monday at 9 p.m eastern we're gonna be doing an indycar full-on indycar preview episode this one was more indy 500 based talking about the prospects of the month of may next week we're gonna be talking in and out everything indycar everything you need to know for the season before the season opener at barber just under two weeks from now and we hope we're gonna have a special guest for that episode for the first time in a while who is more intelligent than myself, especially when it comes to IndyCar, and has even more knowledge than Kyle. So do, of course, check that out. Hope to see you there for that one. And you can check us out on Twitter for any updates. If we have any, that's at Rain Race Podcast. It's been on the screen the whole time if you're watching on YouTube. And, of course, you can check us out tomorrow or the next day because I have been kind of slacking, admittedly, on getting the the recorded episode out on podcasting platforms everywhere. Just search for the Rain Race Podcast. You should be able to find it. For now, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Thank you so much for everybody to everybody for sticking around to this point. Hope to see you next week. Take care. <laughs>